Sage is fighting the fight. He has fought cities. He has fought counties. Politicians. Naysayers. Hell, he's even fought mayors. Thank you for listening to Sage and the Houseless Movement, a weekly show dedicated to the news and views of the homeless locally and worldwide. And all other things considered homeless? (laughs) Yes. Broadcasting live from your Alexa device, the Radio Free Network app, iOS, WMBU.org, Many Voices United, and the Radio Free Network.com. And now, from some wooded area in Akron, Ohio, here is Sage the Rage Lewis. Man, Sage the Rage got real problems. Real problems, I tell you. I think I got a headache. I, you know. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, I feel like, still working on my ums from last week. I really believe that, well, did you hear yesterday in the news that they transplanted a pig liver into a human? Was it a liver or a kidney? Maybe it was a kidney. I can't remember. Took something out of a pig, put it in a brain-dead human because we got to test these things first. Put it out, let it go for like 52 hours. It, 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 It took right away. These are amazing times. But I'm here to tell you, Advil. Advil, thank God for Advil. It's in everybody. I love that shit. Advil, oh my Lord. Just the slightest headache. And nobody tells me to feel bad about it either. Nobody's like, Sage, you better stop taking all that Advil. No way, man. They're just like, whatever. You got inflammation, take Advil. You got a headache, take Advil. I'm like, thank goodness for Advil. I mean, literally, I think we could have just stopped medical progress at Advil. Did you take any philosophy courses in college? Uh, If you didn't, or you didn't go to college, or you didn't take any philosophy classes, well, I guess, whatever, I don't know. People like what they like, but man. So get this. Philosophy is a bunch of wankers running around thinking their entire lives about bullshit. It's the greatest thing ever. It is it is basically academic drugs. It's a waste of fucking time. But damn, it's fun. It's so fun to think about bullshit that has like you think it has ramifications in your life, but it doesn't really. And then ultimately, you're going to find out that nobody really knows the answer. They've been talking about it for hundreds of years, and the moral is, who the fuck knows? But, but damn. It's like the Netflix for bored intellectuals. It's so good. It's so good. And... I guess, like, it does, well, you know, you know, the way they justify it is that, well, it has ramifications of how we all live our lives, I guess, but we all seem to be living our lives just fine without reading a bunch of Descartes and other mostly European German assholes. (laughs) You know, but I like it from a point of view from homelessness and addiction and race and that sort of thing, because I guess like so, 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 so one of the easy big topics right now is critical race theory in schools, right? Big debate. I've conservatives will call up talk radio and be like, I'm against critical race theory. What is critical race theory? <laughs> I love it. And the fact of the matter is who knows what critical race theory is. It's, it's, it, it, it's yes. There's a, a Merriam Webster definition of critical race theory, but then ultimately we make whatever phrase we want into whatever we want. It can mean anything you want. The, the, the definitions of things change. 
So critical race theory could mean, and I think to a lot of white conservatives, it means we're going to bash white people in school by saying white people are the devil, which incidentally uh, Malcolm X did call white people the blue-eyed devils. So, you know, it's not a completely foreign position to take. (laughs) But also, do you want to indoctrinate all your kids making you feel bad because you were born with white skin? To which black people would say, well, I've been... My people have been made to feel bad for the last 400 years for being born with black skin. Have you, did you see Tara Mosley's post on Facebook? Let me see. She put up her like 23 and me. Let me see. Tara Mosley. Let me make sure this is public before I show it. Do, 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 Let me scroll down here. Tara Mosley, if you're not familiar, is a council person here in Akron, Ohio. Maybe she got rid of it. Okay. She Okay. I don't see it here, so I'm not going to look at her puppy dog. Oh, she got a nice haircut. Okay. I don't see it here. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about it, I guess. But it's going to be really interesting to see African Americans posting their 23andMe's genetic reports, okay? Because what you're going to find is African Americans have a lot of European in them. I think a lot of African Americans, it's going to be hard to find a, an African American that doesn't come from a mixed relationship at some point in their history. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. So, and this falls back into free will and determinism, I think, from a point of view of, well, Racists, I think, believe that black people are lazy, are, and racist isn't a, bigots. Let's go with the word bigot. I don't like using the word racist as a negative because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to enlighten people about racist behaviors, even if you aren't intentionally being mean. So let's call it bigot, Okay. So there are white bigots, okay, that hate black people because they, they, well, they think they're lazy, they're stupid, they're criminals, oversexed, blah, blah, blah. And it's just going to be interesting to watch how these bigots, these white bigots, are going to react to black people putting up their 23andMe when they're like 50% them, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Their skin happens to be darker, but genetically, they're 50% European. And it's going to be interesting to watch white bigots put up their 23 and me when they realize that they're not as pure as the driven snow as they thought they were. It's all going to be fascinating. But it all comes back to this esoteric bullshit of free will versus determinism, Okay. And one of the things I hear a lot about homeless people, the people that hate homeless people, bigots to homeless people, is that they are lazy and they need to get a job. They need to put down the needle and they need to get a job, right? And so, and then, and, 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 and bigots to black people are like, hey, you need to get more dads in the picture. Clearly, the problem is that there's not enough dads because there's just these single moms and clearly single moms can't handle their culture. So we need to get more traditional family values in the black community. That's, that's a racist attitude. Okay. I don't think it's an, I don't think it's a bigoted attitude. See, I'm, I'm just right now. I'm, 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 
making making up like these words to use so we can all talk on the same language. Racist is not a negative in the way I'm communicating it. You're just saying racist things in a way that's probably ignorant. A bigoted attitude is negative, right? Saying that a black person is more criminal than a white person is a bigoted statement and racist. It's bigoted. Well, oh, whew, see, this is so challenging because you're basically a bigoted statement means that you think black people are less than white people. That's what I think. That's what I'm where where my definition is. A racist thing is. Well, wouldn't it be helpful if there were more um, traditional families in the black community? Because I just read an article, and it said that they they don't have a lot of dads in the black community. That's a racist attitude. Okay, it's not bad. It's not a. It's not innately bad, but it's racist because it doesn't take the time to understand black culture and the choices people make. I grew up with a single mom. So why am I not a, why am I not in prison? Why am I not a drug dealer? And the bigot will say, well, it's because you're white. You're white. That's why. What if I show you a white person that grew up with a single mom that is a drug dealer and is in prison? What are you going to do then? Well, mostly it's black people. You don't know that. And that's not, it's impossible to, it's, it's statistically actually it's not true. We are finding that Black people and white people use drugs and sell drugs on a very equal playing field. Dr. Kendi believes it has a lot to do with employment, that, that there's lower employment rates in the black community, and then the racist bigot comes back in and says, well, there you go, they should get a job. <laughs> you see? So... What, what I'm saying is a bigot will typically not be willing to explore ideas that they aren't aware of, whereas a racist would be. And you see, I really, really want to erase the, the negative connotations of saying racist things. We all say racist things, okay? We're all learning about diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, including black people, about their own race. Okay? We're all learning. You do not become a racial expert because you popped out of the womb a certain color. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, you do have experiences that give you insight to a culture that other people don't have. So, for example, I have a conservative friend who's running for mayor, and I really, I got to have him on a podcast or a talk, because he's very conservative in his attitudes until he gets to race. <laughs> And then he gets kind of liberal in his, in his beliefs. Why? My theory is because he knows what it's like to be a black man. <laughs> it ain't good. It ain't good in America being a black man. I'm sorry, it ain't. It has nothing to do with being black. It has to do with being in America. <laughs> All black people know that. <laughs> That's obvious, okay? Okay, so... I'm setting all this up to talk about free will versus determinism because a 
oftentimes people who are judging other people, right? People who are judging black people, people who are judging drug addicts, people who are judging homeless people are either never have been those things or transcended out of them. They became the righteous redeemed or whatever. I don't know what you call them. I get a lot of people who, as soon as the minute they become non-homeless, they turn on their homeless brothers and sisters and be like, hey, you need to quit drugs. I'm like, I fought with you for two years to quit drugs. You're like, well, yeah, it took me a long time, but I did it, and now they need to do it. I'm like, okay. You, you don't remember that entire struggle, that time you were uh, living under a bridge and you spent all your money on drugs and gambling, every penny? You don't remember that? In the middle of the winter? No, no, that doesn't ring a bell? Well, yeah, I remember that, but I don't do that anymore. Well, I'm so glad. I'm, I mean, I'm glad that you're happy with where you're at right now, but you were obviously mildly content with where you were at that point in time in your life until you weren't, until it became too painful. And basically what happens is you kind of get older and you're sick of living outside in Northeast Ohio winters, I think. A lot of people don't get tired of meth, though. They get tired of opiates, but, man, a lot of people, they're just, man, that meth, that's, they love it. They love it. I just got a tea bag in my mouth. This is a string. <laughs> so, what haters or bigots like to do is they like to blame the individual, Right? That's the general rest. Uh, uh, that's the general gist, sorry. That they're like, hey, you need to lift yourself up. The person that's in the hole that they're in is like, fuck you, motherfucker. You don't know what it's like. And then, then the people that transcended out are like, I do know what it's like. I used to be right where you are. Yeah, well, you forgot what it was like. You you quickly forgot what it was like when you were in the hole. How easily we forget. Okay? Do you understand? So a bigot will judge somebody that is not them. That's what a bigot is in my definition. A person who's racist will say things that may or may not be negative. They can be positive. You can say racist things that are positive, by the way. Like, Muslims are very family-oriented. A racist statement. That's a general statement that is not based in science or... They're just... They're as family-oriented as anybody else. Okay, that's a racist statement. It's not bad. It's I don't I mean, it's racist because it's uninsightful and not aware of other people's lives, which is coming back to this diversity, equity, and inclusion deal, right? Which is so fun for me because I think a lot of the liberals are like, oh, diversity, equity, inclusion means this to me. <laughs> Oh, oh, sweet, sweet little child. Does it now? So diversity, equity, inclusion comes back to being all about you. It doesn't include conservatives. It doesn't include Christians. It doesn't include rich people. It includes a certain subset of people that you personally feel bad for. Muslims, black people, some black people, not all black people. Most black people are in prison. Eh, don't worry about them, unless you're really a bleeding heart liberal. Uh, it definitely doesn't pertain to conservatives. 
There will be no diversity, equity, and inclusion of people that don't feel that the vaccine for COVID is right for them and their family. No, 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 no. You will mandate the shit out of that. (laughs) Your diversity, equity, and inclusion only goes so far. Don't be stupid. What about the African-Americans and Hispanics that don't want the, the vaccine? Well, come on, Sage. This is a public health issue. This is different. Oh, is it? It's not... There's no there's no diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in health care? Okay. I, I'm good. Hey, Christopher, my man. Look into Christopher James Anderson running for mayor 2023 at Akron, Ohio. Look it in look into him. For the record, I'm running too. I believe in choice. I believe in choice. Let's do this. Let's, uh, I want to show you this, this video about free will. Okay. Yeah, let's do this. Outcomes are essentially fixed based upon either fate or natural processes that underlie everything, even our supposed choices. Causality. Action. Reaction. Cause. And fate. Neo and humans are the personification of free will. Smith and the machines are the personification of determinism. The matrix itself is a system of control, a deterministic device within which people live out their lives, ignorant that they are ultimately slaves to a computer program. The plot leads to an unavoidable conflict between free will and determinism, between choice and inevitability. In the first film, if looked at from a choice-centered perspective, Neo chooses to fight instead of run. In the second, Neo chooses Trinity over Zion, And in the third, Neo chooses to both fight and to let Smith win, albeit temporarily. Or did Neo ever really make a choice? From a deterministic perspective, one could easily argue that Neo never made a choice throughout the entire trilogy. Did Neo choose to stay and fight Smith, or did his belief that he might be the one determine his action to stay and fight? Did Neo choose to save Trinity, or did his emotional attachment to her determine his refusal of the architect's proposition? Did Neo choose to let Smith win, or were his actions determined by faith in the Oracle's cryptic words? Everything that has a beginning has an end. For me, this is the beauty of The Matrix. The movies never answered the philosophical dilemmas. Every possible answer lies on a double-edged sword. If one argues that choice won out because Smith lost, a counter could be that no scenario existed for Smith to win. If Neo was able to fight forever, he would prove to Smith that a human's will could be as strong as a computer program. If Neo chose to give up, like he did, Smith does his thing and is destroyed. A predetermined no-win situation for Smith. If one argues that determinism won out because Neo was forced to give up, a counter could be that Neo's sacrifice proves the reality of choice, as no rational, self-aware being could ever willingly end their own life without free will. Whether one walked away from the Matrix movies happy or disappointed, I would bet that an overwhelming majority at least walked away with a greater understanding of two popular philosophical problems that, to this day, are still debated. This is the brilliance of the Matrix, the framing of the dilemma, not the resolution. Okay, so that's the moral of the story. Yes. Do we have free will or is everything determined? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> and I'm telling you that is the conundrum of life. Okay? There's a scene where in the matrix where he breaks a vase he's with the the oracle and she just trips him out she's like you know what's going to really spin your noodle is did you know this or that it was going to you know so you if you <laughs> so let's take let's take a drug addict okay There is a person in Akron, Ohio, right now, looking at 
a rock of meth, okay? That meth is sitting in a little baggie right now. That meth is not in them. That meth is not going to jump into a pipe and be smoked, okay? That person is going to take the little piece of meth, put it in a pipe, and smoke it. I really have never seen anybody smoke it. I don't know how it works. <laughs> and I've never done it myself. Looks too good to me, ladies and gentlemen. I will be avoiding meth. Everybody loves it too much. I got enough problems. It's birthday week. Cake is coming. Holy crap. Not for me. My wife's birthday. So, on the surface, it looks like free will, right? In AA, they'll say you can't have the 20th beer if you don't have the first, right? That's free will. But, philosophically, what if the path has already been determined? What if you are on a path that there is only one outcome? Where that crystal of meth is going to be put, picked up and put in that pipe. And furthermore, what if that leads to incredible goodness? Do you know how many kids I have seen whose parents are homeless and drug addicts who are incredible, incredible. I see kid after kid after kid who is kind and generous and intelligent, emotionally intelligent, whose parents by all accounts are total losers. My dad, not a total loser, but I absolutely was more influenced by his lack of presence than his presence. Do you, does that make sense? My dad left when I was seven, and he lives in Colorado. He... He, I'm not getting involved. This makes him very upset. I've blocked him on Facebook because he can't have these conversations. And it's my life, too. I get to share these conversations. I'm sorry. I do. I'm not angry at my dad. I mean, I'm angry, I'm angry at my dad when I'm angry. You know, like when I get angry, I'm angry at everything. Right now, I'm not angry. I'm not angry at my dad. It has nothing to do with my dad. It just has to do with how I feel generally about the world right now. Does that make sense? I'm not angry at my dad because I'm not angry at anybody today. <laughs> However, just saying the word angry kind of gets me angry. Anyways. Who's to say that my father leaving me at age seven wasn't the best thing that ever happened to me? To this day, I wouldn't wish it on any seven-year-old, let alone my own self. I know for one thing, my dad wouldn't have let me go to college. My dad wouldn't have let me study the cello. Um, and there you go. And I wouldn't be sitting here today wasting your time on Facebook. <laughs> I'd probably be some crazy psycho fundamentalist Christian in the mountains of Colorado. He did have one son that he did raise and that guy actually moved to North Dakota to make his money in oil, which I totally respect. Like, I'm like, that's a cool idea. I think he married into some trucking industry. I don't know what that guy's like. I don't know. Who cares? I'm supposed to care about my half-brother. I give no fucks about my half-brother. I have a other half-brother who is older than me, and I do like him, but I never see him, and he never sees me. But I like him because... He's a really cool guy. <laughs> Very giving, wonderful guy. But I have no desire to call him up and be like, hey, John, let's go hang out. And he doesn't have any desire to call me either 
Or maybe he does. I don't know. I don't know what goes on in his mind, but I think we're fine with who we are. I think a lot of him. I think very highly of my half-brother who's older than me. But, so, you can't know what your choices and actions are going to lead to. So while you might end up dying on the streets in a ditch from an opiate overdose, which happens all the time, incidentally, but that could lead to incredible goodness, you know? If nothing else, you had a good story, didn't you? I mean, the things you saw on your ride to the, to the basement were pretty uh, amazing. Think of all the people who lead safe, boring lives. They do nothing to stand out. They take zero risks. They probably are happy with their lives, too. But did they have an exciting life? Not likely. <laughs> we all watch, we watch these exciting movies to vicariously live through other people's lives who have had exciting lives because we're too afraid to live our own exciting lives. You know, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Spider-Man, all of these people are living incredibly exciting lives that we are all too afraid to live ourselves. And don't give me the bullshit, well, I'm not a wizard or a superhero. You could get out there. What's... Spider, how's Spider-Man making a living? <laughs> how's, how's Superman making a living? They're doing all this work for free. You know? They're putting their careers on the back burners to be good people. You could do that. Well, I mean, come on. I have bills to pay. I'm as guilty as you. I'm not judging you. The only reason I get to do what I do is because my wife feels and I feel that I'm contributing financially enough to the family, which I am, I think. I am, yeah. She's happy with how I am, how much I'm contributing, and so then she's like, do whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> but so, so I'm no better than anybody else. I'm not, I'm not sacrificing anything in my journey. Nothing, literally nothing. <laughs> if you think I'm sacrificing anything doing my work, you don't know me. You don't know my life. This is all just cherries on top of a wonderful, wonderful, delicious life Sunday. I'm planning on when I retire, my kid moves out and we pay for college, then I'm really I'm going to lean into it more. If I'm still alive, who knows, right? You get the pancreatic cancer, it's over. See ya! Lights out. So don't think I'm any better than anybody. I'm, lo I'm talking to myself. So often I'm talking to myself. You know, when I put controversial stuff on Facebook, you, a lot of times people get really ruffled that I'm yelling at them. I'm always yelling at me. <laughs> you know, they think I'm yelling at them. I'm yelling at me. Telling myself to wake up, get a life, grow up, be a man, be a, be a mensch. So, What do you think? Do you think there's free will? And by free will, I mean at any given time, you could go right or left, up or down. And it was not predetermined. You can't prove it. It's impossible to prove. Everything that you do, hold your breath for 15 seconds. Ah, uh, we knew that was coming. A billion years in the future, we knew you were going to hold your breath for 15 seconds. 
You never can prove you have free will. Okay? But yet, we judge people all the time because we don't like the way they're doing their free will. You get it? We look at them and they're like, oh, you should do that. Oh, you should do this. Oh, yeah? Why don't you just shut the fuck up and go look at your own shitty life? Because I guarantee you got things to work on. But you rather judge somebody else because you don't want to work on your shit. You don't want to lose weight. You don't want to exercise. You don't want to get that extra degree. You don't want to save money. That shit ain't fun. You don't want to be a better husband, a better wife, a better parent. So what you're going to do is you're going to just uh, shit on people that are already being shit on. <laughs> Doesn't that strike you as funny? And not ha-ha funny, but funny, like sadistically funny. You look at somebody who is suffering a person who is poor, addicted to shitty street drugs, and then you have the gall to kick them when they're down. Oh, that person should do this. Oh, that person should do that. Oh, tick, tick, tisk, 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 tisk. You have a lifetime of bullshit you could be working on in your life, but you like to spend it judging other people. That's what the news is. It's all the news is. It's you judging other people, being afraid of other people, looking down on other people. That's what sells. Got all these murders going on in the, in the cities. And what are white people doing? What are middle-class suburban Bedroom community people doing? Judging them. Ah, oh, well, it's because they don't have dads. Ah, oh, well, it's because they're, they're not getting jobs. Ah, oh, it's because they're lazy. Ah, oh, it's because they, they don't uh, finish school. Maybe if you had any basic understanding of phil philosophy and humanity, you might realize that a lot of the shit that happens in your life is predetermined. Why don't you not go to work today? Why don't you stop listening to me? Why don't you go back to bed? Why don't you get up an hour early? Look at your life and what kind of absolutely mind-numbingly boring routine your life is. Look at it. They only put that effort into helping. Yeah, hi, Michelle. There you go. Michelle says, if they only put that effort into helping. So, you look out past yourself, ignoring your own issues, ignoring your own weaknesses, and you look at other people and you judge them. Well, they should do this. Well, they should do that. Because you know why? Because that's the easy thing to do. Then you can go back to your regularly scheduled programming of, you know, making dinner, going to work. Uh, watching a bunch of Netflix. By the way, you should watch Midnight Mass, seven episodes. Wonderful analysis of looking at Christianity, I think. Very entertaining. Please watch it. It's on Netflix. Please go watch Midnight Mass. Or, as Michelle points out, you could say, oh, there's a problem. How can I help? Now, most people aren't going to do that because they won't even help themselves. You know what I'm saying? They could spend that same time looking in at their own life and judging themselves and being like, oh, well, I'm a dick. Um, I'm mean to people. I'm condescending. I'm, I'm judgmental. I'm quick to judge. I'm fat. I'm lazy. I don't exercise. There's a million things that are so wrong with you. I'm going to help myself. You can help anybody. Help a goddamn tree. Paint. Go. Like, go pet a tree. 
Do anything. Do anything. Misery loves company, Michelle says. There it is. Then you get to feel sorry for yourself, don't you? Woe is me. I live in a bad neighborhood. Woe is me. Humanity sucks. Woe is me. I live in a a on a on a planet that's dying because of c- carbon gases. Woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. And isn't that the great human pastime of feeling sorry for ourselves? <laughs> Do you know that Stephen King book, Misery, the movie, did you watch that? He gets uh, basically abducted by, uh, what's that one woman's name, that actress? I can't remember. It's all about his addiction to cocaine. Go read or watch the movie again, Misery, in light of the author, being addicted to cocaine. (laughs) And sweet sorrow is sweet, right? The poets know it. Sweet sorrow. It is wonderful. It is a a kind of comforting thing. Hey, Christopher. Love the movie, what, The Matrix? Which movie do you love, man? WMVU, Many Voices United, ladies and gentlemen, brought to you by WMVU, Many Voices United. Go check it out online. A lot of great programming run by Christophus Dominic. Very, very cool African-American man who wants to actually run a uh, misery. Oh, misery. Oh, yeah. I wish she put a two by four between my. Oh, ah. That was the scene, wasn't it? That was the scene. I don't want to divulge Christopher's uh, plans. I don't know what he wants, but he's got big plans. He's a cool dude. He's a cool dude. Uh, That, yeah, that is Stephen King's wrestling with cocaine, okay? Okay. When a writer decides to quit their addiction, a lot of writers are alcoholics. Raymond Carver, one of my favorite. They're always worried that if they quit their addiction, they're not going to be as good a writer. And I'm sorry to say it. I liked Raymond Carver's writing while he was drunk. I'm sorry. It did. It did. He got a little too wordy after he got sober. I'm sorry. It's a real worry. His writing was so crisp and perfect. Crisp isn't the right word. Just condensed. Oh, damn, Raymond Carver. Good job, buddy. So how much choice do we have? And if you're following it along about free will versus determinism, you, I'm telling you, the answer is we don't know. Incredibly great thinkers have spent their life trying to figure out if life is predetermined or if there's free will. And I'm here to tell you, the answer is we don't know. We don't know. So if some of the smartest people in the history of humanity cannot tell you whether or not your life is free or determined, how the hell do you have the audacity to judge anyone, including yourself? Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? If the greatest philosophers in the history of humanity who dedicated their lives to thinking about whether or not we have free will or our lives are predetermined, don't know. How can you, who is not a philosopher in determinism versus free will, 
have the garish audacity to think that it's all free will. You like free will because you are afraid of the idea that your life is already predetermined. That's the only reason you like free will. Because you like to think you're on this ride called life and you're allowed to go anywhere you want. That's the only reason you like free will. Because the other determinism is terrifying. What does it mean? Let's say all of a sudden I've, conv I've convinced you to be a determinist, all right? You're like, all right, Sage, I, I now believe everything is predetermined, which is not a good idea because we don't know the answer to that. But let's just say I did. I'm not trying to make you a determinist, but whatever, you listen to this and you're like, yep, now I, I do believe everything is predetermined. And so what you do is then you just go sit down on a couch because you're like, hey, if I'm supposed to be the president of the United States, I'm not going to be able to sit here on this couch all day or the rest of my life. The free will people would be like, you just sat down on that motherfucking couch, asshole. I have a family member he long since dead. He came home one day in his 50s or something, early 50s, and he said to his wife, he said, God only gives us so much energy, and I've used all my energy. And he walked upstairs and went to bed. I am not shitting you. And he spent decades in that bed. Decades. And he controlled that house from that bed. His wife would be on the phone. He would listen on the phone. You know, because they had those corded phones. You could listen to the phone, you know. He had a bell. She had to run up there whenever he needed something. Was that free will or was that determinism? You don't know. Who knows? Who knows if it was free will or determinism? The point is, so take, take Michelle. Okay, Michelle was, she wrote something nice. She said, if only they put that effort into helping. Okay, Michelle's a helper, right? I know many helpers. Michelle's a helper. And she does a lot. There's a giving box, a blessing box, she calls it. They put on my property that they put food in. And it's, it's awesome. It's so awesome. But here's the deal. Did Michelle wake up one day and move the, through the universe independently to become a helper? Or was her entire life, as she looked back, moving towards that direction? Do you know why I help? Because I had a midlife crisis in the 2008 recession. My company tanked. <coughs> Can't even say it. <laughs> I felt betrayed. I had to hurt a lot of people by firing a lot of people. I, I felt betrayed by capitalism, okay? That's what it was. I felt like making money was not the dream everybody told me it would be. I didn't even really like the things I would get with money. I didn't I didn't appreciate when I made a lot of money. I didn't even know it. I would I'd meet with my accountant and they'd be like, "Hey, you made a quarter of a million dollars this year." I'm like, "Oh, really?" I'm like huh. Like I wasn't excited. I wasn't excited. Money doesn't motivate me. Now it motivates other people, and that's great. But doesn't. So if I was I was in an institution called capitalism that is focused on money, 
and I don't really care about money, and I had to do a lot of painful things and experience a lot of painful things in the name of money, of course I'm going to get out. But as you can see, I'm selling a book in the back there, Homeless Activist. Find it anywhere. Just Google the Homeless Activist book. I'm a marketer. So I haven't really changed. I mean, my, all my learnings, I still am very competitive. I'm still, I still enjoy online marketing and all that stuff, but I'm moving it towards a nonprofit idea. I'm, I'm taking all those skills and that stuff and, and shifting it. I didn't make a 90 degree turn by becoming a homeless activist. I just started going down another path slightly off to the left or the right or wherever. I didn't, I didn't change drastically. <laughs> I've always been a caring person. I've always been a passionate person, a thoughtful person. I hope that doesn't sound too garish. I think those are honest. I'm not saying I'm any good at those things, but those are things I think I am. So, yeah. So, when you look at my my trajectory, it's not surprising at all that I'm helping homeless people. You wouldn't have guessed it when I was a musician in college. You know, my wife literally thought she was marrying a musician. I knew full well I wasn't going to be a musician. These, she thought I was going to be a musician. I told her I wasn't going to be a musician, but she's like, I want to marry a musician. Well, you kind of marry the wrong guy. <laughs> I mean, I still play. And now she has a son who's a wonderful musician. So, uh, it, I, I still, I still, I'm learning the piano right now. So, but I knew I wasn't going to make a career out of music. I knew it. So it doesn't surprise me at all. Now I would love to go back to 19 year old, 20 year old Sage and be like, Hey, what do you think? Let me tell you the story of our lives from the age 20 to 50. What do you think? I'd love to know if he would be surprised or if he'd be like, yeah, I can see that. That's all right. I think he'd be disappointed in me. I mean, because I've always been disappointed in myself. <laughs> There's nothing new there. Uh, There's nothing new there. I'm always feel inadequate. So, I'm here to tell you, you cannot know whether or not your life is determined or free will. If you look at your life and look at the habits you're in, I would be surprised to think that you believe you have much free will at all. I would be very surprised if you were like, oh, yeah, man, every day I wake up, I make my own free decisions. Oh, do you? Do you? I love to overeat every single day. I love to stay up late watching stupid TV. Every day I do those things. I love to drink into oblivion. <laughs> oh, yeah, you free willed that, did you? Okay. If that makes you happy, I guess, then you just keep doing you. <laughs> I don't know how anybody thinks that their life is, I mean, it could be free. I think I think that we have the opportunity to go in different directions, which leads us to an idea of free will. We'll never know if that choice, like, you know, when things change, you know, when people's lives change, when something happens to them against their free will, a car accident, cancer, a death of a loved one. That's when their lives change. Usually when I look at my homeless friends, I can see it's a very, they know exactly when they became homeless or was started the path to homelessness. And almost always it's something that happened to them. They broke their back at work. They were repeatedly raped as children by their family. 
multiple members of their family. Um, I have some people that will tell me that they had a great childhood and then I tell, they tell me their childhood and I'm like, wow, that's kind of fucked up though. I know people that are homeless, not homeless, tell me they had a great childhood and then I hear about their childhood. Oh, I'm like, oh really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, just so you know, that doesn't happen to a lot of people. Or maybe it does, but it's not supposed to. Just saying. Just saying. So if we can look, and then, and then of course, trauma, right? Our ACEs scores. Do you know ACEs? Let me get you ACEs. ACEs trauma scores. Let's, let's look at this. Okay, aces2high.com. What are, what's aces, PCS? Okay, have, do you have? All right. There are 10 types of childhood trauma measured in the K CDC permanent, blah, 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 childhood study. There's many others see below. Five are personal, physical abuse, verbal abuse. Okay, can you see these? Okay, the five are personal, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, and emotional neglect. Five are related to other family members, parents who's an alcoholic, a mother who's a victim of domestic violence, a family member in jail, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness, experiencing divorce of parents. Hey, Silk. Each trauma, each type of trauma counts as one, okay? So a person who's been physically abused with an alcoholic parent and a mother who was beaten up has an ACEs score of three. So you can do this yourself, right? Play along. There are, of course, many other types of childhood trauma, racism, bullying, watching a sibling, being abused, losing a caregiver, like a mother, grandmother or mother, homelessness, surviving or recovering a severe accident. I'm a survivor even with the courts here. Yeah. Right on. Anybody want to put down what their ACEs score is? Okay, physical, this is what happened to you when you were a kid. I'll try mine. Physical abuse, no. Verbal abuse, no. Sexual abuse, no. Physical neglect, no. Emotional neglect, no, none, okay? Parent was an alcoholic, no. A mother who was in domestic violence, no. Member in jail, no. A family member diagnosed with a mental illness, no. Experiencing a divorce of parents, one. I got a one. I'm a one, okay? All right? So I get one, okay? So it's important thing to remember is that A score is meant as a guideline. If you experienced other types of toxic stress over months or years, those would likely increase your risk of health consequences depending on positive childhood experiences you had. Prior, so, okay, listen to this. Prior to your 18th birthday, listen to some of these. Did a parent or an adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? Damn. Did a parent or adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, throw, or something at you, or even hit you so hard you had marks? Did an adult or a person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or touch the body in a sex or have you touch their body in a sexual way? Attempt to have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you. So anyways, I don't need to go. Okay, first a tiny bit of background to help you figure it out. Uh, the, this study uncovered a stunning link between childhood trauma and chronic diseases people developed as adults, as well as social and emotional problems. This includes heart disease, lung cancer, diabetes, many autoimmune diseases, as well as depression, violence, and being a victim of violence and suicide. These things lead to... Uh, you got two for a kid? Okay. Um, these things lead to physical illnesses. Okay? So talk about predeterminism. You didn't have any choice in the matter that your father beat you, your, your, your uncle raped you. You didn't. But yet it has physical and emotional connotations. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the WMVU broadcast this week. Many Voices United. I love you.
and I will see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to Sage and the Houseless Movement, a weekly show dedicated to the news and views of the homeless locally and worldwide.